Yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending this afternoon session on privacy conscious data sharing in financial services. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Ramon Troncoso Pastoriza. I'm a senior researcher at the EPFL in Lausanne, uh, working in the application of uh, advanced cryptographic techniques for privacy protection in outsourced and distributed data sharing scenarios. Uh, I am affiliated with the Laboratory for Data Security, led by Professor Jean-Pierre Hibault. Uh, and uh, I want to first thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to give this talk uh, at this uh, very relevant event organized by ITU. Uh, so the outline of the talk uh, deals first with the uh, main data sharing needs in financial services. I will briefly uh, detail which are these uh, needs, the privacy threats that are also associated with uh, data sharing. Uh, and then I'll go to the basics on security and privacy, so what we mean or what we understand from the technology side uh, uh, for security and privacy, what's the difference, and we will focus in this talk only on privacy, not, not on security. And uh, then I will uh, survey the main technology for privacy protection with a special focus on homomorphic encryption. It's kind of the, the uh, same graal of uh, secure computing and one of the most promising techniques for enabling uh, outsourced and distributed computation in outsourced, in uh, untrusted or untrustworthy environments. Uh, I'll go through the fundamental concepts, the uh, way that it can enable secure outsourcing and secure distributed computing, uh, the available libraries that have been produced right now, so the, the practical aspects of homomorphic encryption, and the main standardization initiative that, start, that has been started uh, and that has been running for the last uh, two years already. Uh, then I will show an example on the medical sector, uh, just to my, my background on the, the recent work that I have done in the last uh, five, ten years is focused on the protecting data in the medical sector. It's the most paradigmatic case uh, where data is highly sensitive and it must be protected for it to be shared, for enabling sharing and enabling processing these data. Uh, but the analogies with the financial case are also kind of obvious. So the, the technologies and the way that these technologies are translated into practical settings and practical applications uh, can follow the same path as for the, the health sector. Uh, so I will finish with some conclusions and uh, paths forward. Uh, so for financial services, uh, the, there are clear benefits in uh, sharing data. And this is uh, an image that comes from a report uh, produced by the World Economic Forum uh, last month, well, two months ago in, in September. Uh, and they have identified there uh, that by sharing data, inbound, outbound, and also collectively sharing data, uh, it's possible to uh, have benefits both for institutions in terms of enriching decision-making systems, uh, bringing knowledge that is not available at the, uh, at the uh, bank uh, institutions, draw on third-party capabilities by outsourcing data and ha having the possibility of analyzing this data, mixing this data with um, other sources that are, again, not available at the, at the bank, and achieve a greater scale of data by sharing uh, across different banks, different financial institutions. For the regulators, this also presents uh, an opportunity to support innovation and competition and to provide an effective systemic oversight by also having access to uh, a more straight, streamlined uh, auditability more transparency and uh, better accountability. And for customers, uh, of course, the availability of more data means that all the analysis and all the research, uh, all the computation that is performed the data will uh, end up in more accurate, more precise, more personalized uh, analysis that can bring uh, more targeted uh, services, more adequate services uh, for the customers. On the other hand, uh, by enabling this data research, uh, uh, probably the, the most uh, clear drawback is that customers lose control on their data or can lose the, the, the control on their data. So the risk that their personal data can be misused, there might be breaches or leaks of sensitive information if the data is not correctly protected. Uh, depending on the trust of the institutions to which they, they shared, uh, there's the potential uh, risk of misuse breaches of, uh, of privacy. This also concerns regulators and concerns the data, data protection regulations uh, and ethical guarantees that have to be uh, uh, provided for uh, processing and treatment of, uh, uh, of personal and identifiable data. 
And for institutions, uh, it's not only a privacy issue, but also a confidentiality issue. Sharing data that can be part of the, the core business of, uh, of a financial institution can be a risk of exposing uh, to uh, competitive knowledge that is part of the, the, uh, the core business of the, of the bank. Uh, so all this, uh, if we put it also in the framework of the current trends and the uh, most recent scandals in terms of uh, privacy uh, breaches, and uh, leaks of privacy information. Uh, we have seen that in the last five years, uh, special attention has been put uh, both from the media, but also from the regulators in how private and sensitive information, how personal information should be dealt with and how this uh, information should be protected in order to preserve, to preserve the rights of the customers, the rights of the citizens uh, by the end of the day. Uh, this, together with um, scandals like, for example, the Cambridge Analytica one, that is uh, a perfect example of how personal data can be misused, even if they, they are, there are already uh, organizational measures in place and there are policies that should prevent and, and data transfer and data, data use agreements that should prevent this misuse of the data. If there's no technological guarantee that can prevent this misuse, then data can be still at risk. Uh, in the health, in the case of the health sector, uh, the, the U.S. government uh, has this uh, web page online. It is the portal uh, from the Department of Health and, and Human Services, where all the breaches affecting more, more than 500 people have to be declared. And the trend and the, the rate at which these breaches occur is around five breaches per week. So it's uh, kind of alarming uh, the rate at which uh, health data is being uh, targeted, and uh, also, analogously, uh, it's uh, the same case for, for financial data. Uh, in terms of, of regulations, we are also witnessing in the last years an evolution of uh, regulation towards more uh, guarantees for the guarantees uh, for the individuals. Uh, in particular, in Europe, uh, we have the, the new GDPR, you know, G General Data Protection Regulation, uh, but also uh, across the rest of the, the globe, uh, and um, we've also seen uh, we've also seen that in, in the in the U.S. Uh, regarding especially health data, but also uh, other types of data and other types of, um, of uh, uh, segments, uh, that there's an evolution towards further guarantees and more strict protection, more strict uh, uh, conditions on how uh, personal data should be uh, processed and dealt with. So in the case of, um, the case of personalized medicine, uh, data sharing brings exactly the same benefits as for uh, financial services. So more personal, more uh, uh, better predictive, uh, more accurate and more participatory, so more uh, targeted and personalized uh, diagnosis, uh, preventive measures, and uh, a better healthcare by the end of the day. Uh, this, again, is completely analogous to the benefits uh, that are brought by uh, data sharing in financial services. And when we're dealing with it, the data sharing, we can uh, adopt two different approaches. Either the centralized approach that is shown here on the left by bringing all the data from different institutions to a central repository and then doing the computation or the processing of this data at this central place. Of course, this facilitates uh, data sharing uh, from a logistic uh, point of view, but uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, privacy preservation, uh, this central point uh, represents a central point of failure that in case it is breached, then the data from the whole network it can be at risk. Plus, if we are talking about cross-border uh, collaboration, cross-border data sharing, uh, this is not always possible because the regulations and the policies might prevent the individual data to cross uh, uh, boundaries, to cross the borders. Uh, so in order to prevent that, uh, normally the, the approach that is taken in uh, most of the uh, most widespread uh, health applications is to keep the data as close to the source as possible and bring the computation to the data. So this decentralized approach is much more uh, privacy sensitive, let's say, uh, or privacy aware. And uh, in this case, if one of the sites is breached, then only the data at that site uh, is breached. And it's not the whole uh, network that is, uh, that is at risk. And we will see with, uh, that with some of the techniques, it's even possible to avoid that breaches in one of the sites uh, can affect even the data at that site. Uh, so after setting the, the stage and the, the landscape 
uh, for uh, security and privacy in uh, the, the health and financial sector and the need for data sharing and the perils, the, the risk of data sharing. Uh, let me just briefly summarize uh, what I mean when I talk about security and privacy. And when I mention security, uh, what I mean is the rightful access to the data. And this means uh, who can uh, get access to the data and who has to be denied access to the data. This involves, technologically speaking, access control, so often authentication, authorization, so currently identifying uh, the users and uh, granting them the exact rights that they should be uh, given for accessing the, the data that they are entitled to. Availability, so protection against denial of service attacks and um, getting the services uh, available and accessible uh, for the, the time that they, are, they should be uh, uh, running. Auditability, uh, so be able to log and trace back the actions happening in the system and accountability, so verifying uh, what happened in the system and who is the responsible uh, for uh, a given action happening in the system or a given a, a breach uh, or leak uh, if it is detected due to uh, the, the auditability properties. Privacy uh, is somehow linked uh, to security. I mean, there can be no privacy without security, but um, in a sense, it affects a completely different dimension of the, the data protection and it deals with rightful use not access so security can protect the access to the data but once the data is accessed how the data is used and whether it is used according to the consent and according to the wishes of the data owner this is what privacy deals with and this is mostly translated into policies uh, in a central system is uh, can be a, a uh, audited and, and can be uh, protected to, to some extent, but in distributed settings and in data sharing scenarios, protection of privacy is much more difficult from a technological perspective. And this is this means translating the consent, translating the terms of use, and translating the policies into technology guarantees that can enforce the uh, regulation, that can enforce and uh, fulfill the, the wishes expressed by the data owner. So in order to uh, protect and to achieve these, uh, these privacy guarantees, uh, there are several advanced um, cryptographic and non-cryptographic techniques uh, that can be applied uh, for protecting the data uh, while it is stored, when it is transferred, uh, and also while it is being computed with. So the first one is the, the most a widespread one is traditional encryption, so it can protect data at rest and in transit. This is the, the usual techniques that are used when contacting the, the bank for securing the, the connection and the transmission of uh, sensitive information uh, to the bank. Also, the same happens for, for uh, health and medical services. But uh, it has the, the drawback that it cannot protect the data while it is being computed on. So whenever we uh, are outsourcing data or sending the data to another party, and we don't trust this or the party, if we need this party to become a processor, so to have to uh, realize or execute some computation on this data, traditional encryption cannot protect uh, this data from uh, this outsourced or this uh, third party from accessing it, because they need to decrypt it before they compute on it. For that, we can resort to uh, these three uh, different approaches that are the main uh, uh, technology tools, technological tools uh, and, uh, and approaches to protect data during computation and protect data against the processor itself when it is not trustworthy. So there are two software-based approaches and one hardware-based approach. The, the main uh, and most promising technology and the one in which I will uh, focus most of the, the rest of the, the talk is homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is intended to protect computation in untrusted environments by uh, enabling some computations directly on the encrypted data without having to decrypt it first. The limitations that it presents are uh, regarding versatility and efficiency, and then we'll have some more details in the next slides. Secure, com secure multi-party computation, on the other hand, it can protect computation in distributed environments. So the target of uh, secure multi-party computation is to enable to uh, have some results on data that comes from different sources, from different uh, data providers, without leaking any further information about the inputs of the other data providers to any other, anyone else in the, in the network. 
and the only thing that the, uh, that the bodies that are uh, collaborating in the computation should learn is the result and whatever can be inferred from the result, nothing else. The problem that it presents is that it has a high communication overhead. We can we'll also go uh, very briefly through, through secure multi-body computation. And finally, uh, we have also hardware-based approaches. Uh, so software-based approaches are not dependent on the uh, architecture or dependent on the systems where they are, they are implemented. So there are no constraints in terms of uh, the supporting architecture or the infrastructure where they are deployed. But for trust execution environments, the assumption here is that there is a secure module, a tamper-proof module that exists within the untrusted environment and that can perform some computation without anybody else uh, being able to look into the, the internals of what's happening within this uh, secure model. It's normally uh, called a secure enclave. And being, uh, so having access to this uh, hardware trusted element uh, is very convenient for, for uh, sending data to untrusted work environments because you have kind of an extension of the security perimeter uh, of your institution within the uh, third party can be, for example, a cloud, and whatever happens in there is protected and is uh, not accessible by anybody else, even if they have a physical access to the computer and to the processor where this uh, processing is happening. The uh, drawback that it presents, because it's, it's uh, actually um, a very efficient, so the overhead in, in terms of uh, computational complexity that it presents each is uh, much lower than the software-based solutions, and work encryption multi implementation. But on your hand, it requires trust in the manufacturer. Uh, so for example, right now, the most widespread solution for uh, trust execution environments is, uh, is uh, produced by Intel. It's called SEX, the Secure Guard Extensions. And uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever a customer is uh, resorting to this technology, they are trusting that Intel is building this uh, computer technology correctly, that there are no side channels, and uh, that uh, uh, of course, Intel is the one that is uh, attesting uh, every computation that happens with these modules and that is uh, helping producing the keys that are used to encrypt the data that is sent to these secure enclaves. Uh, furthermore, uh, even if the data is encrypted at all times within the enclave and in the memory that the enclave accesses, uh, the patterns uh, in which the memory is accessed can be, uh, uh, can be discovered or can be uh, eavesdropped uh, by an attacker that has physical access to the, to the system. And from these side channels, it's possible to build some attacks and to infer some information about some data uh, that is processed within the enclave. So these techniques protect data at rest in transit and during computation from the computing infrastructure. But what happens when we release the data to the authorized user, to the authorized researcher that wants to perform some, some computation of the data or uh, some lab, some uh, a, a pharma company or some uh, a data analysis a, a entity that a, wants to obtain some results, some aggregated results a, on privacy sensitive data. A, in this case, it's possible also to build attacks a, on and try to infer some information about individuals a, that were part of the cohort, that were part of the database that a, was used to produce some results just by having access to those results and some uh, additional information. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, if we have a, a database of, uh, uh, of uh, personal records uh, with information of the, the age, the address, the phone, etc., uh, even if this information is not disclosed, but we have some aggregate results on uh, this information, if an attacker knows, uh, for example, what's the age range of a target uh, individual, uh, what's the, the, uh, the population that it belongs to, that he belongs or she belongs to, uh, with this uh, additional information, uh, he can determine whether these results were produced by a database that contained this individual or not. And just belonging to a database can be uh, a sensitive data that is, uh, uh, has the risk of, of being disclosed through these attacks. So in order to protect uh, data release and uh, mitigate these inference attacks, uh, one uh, framework and one, uh, the most widespread technique uh, that is used is called differential privacy. And this builds on adding some noise, blurring the results and how, so reducing the, the data utility of the aggregated results uh, and uh, making more difficult the uh, a successful execution of this, uh, infer uh, these inference attacks. Because it's kind of uh, unlinking the uh, relation between the input data 
and the uh, output results by adding this random uh, random uh, source or random noise uh, to the output results. I will also go a bit into, into details for this, uh, for this technique. Uh, and finally, uh, especially in, in the, the financial sector, uh, there's no security privacy uh, talk that can go away without mentioning the, the blockchains. Uh, so right now, this is a really overhyped uh, technology. So the, the, the promise uh, that, uh, that blockchains uh, brought during the, the last two three years um, has brought to an euphoria, let's say, on, on how these technologies can be used and what they can actually uh, uh, provide uh, that goes well beyond uh, what they actually uh, can grant in a practical scenario. And they are uh, very good, uh, uh, very adequate techniques uh, when guaranteeing or when uh, trying to uh, achieve integrity protection, auditability, transparency, in a distributed setting where uh, we have several different institutions that don't mutually trust each other. But this is the complete transparency. So the transparency that blockchains provide is the complete opposite to privacy protection. So no sensitive information or no, uh, individual uh, or uh, personal information uh, should be put on a blockchain without the appropriate protection mechanisms. So whenever blockchains are used in connection with personal data, these other techniques have to be in place also in order to protect this data. Because blockchains, the only thing that they will do is worsen the, the privacy problem. So I will not uh, mention blockchains again because that's not the, the, the target of the talk. Uh, but of course, if, uh, if uh, you have some specific question about privacy and blockchain, uh, I'll be happy also to, to, to answer it. And for sure, if you want to interrupt me during the, during the talk, don't hesitate to do that. So uh, I will go now uh, very briefly through the uh, difference between traditional encryption and homomorphic encryption. Uh, so going through the, the basics of how encryption works, uh, what's the principle behind homomorphic encryption, what are the different types of homomorphic encryption, and uh, then also the, the um, uh, standards effort and the practical libraries that implement the, the most recent uh, homo, uh, homomorphic encryption uh, schemes. And afterwards, I will also go uh, very briefly through multi-party invitation uh, and differential privacy. So when we talk about uh, traditional encryption, uh, there are two main kinds of encryption, either uh, symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption, public key encryption, also called. Symmetric encryption uh, uses a, a unique uh, key. Can you see that? Oh, you cannot. OK. Uh, uh, symmetric encryption uses a, a sole key. Uh, to uh, protect all the data. That means that this key is used both for encryption and for decryption. Uh, and both the sender and the recipient of secret information protected with uh, symmetric encryption uh, have to uh, or must have access to this uh, secret key. So the, this, uh, this encryption is normally used for uh, uh, protecting the communication channels uh, between different endpoints in the, in the web uh, communication. And uh, it can hide information uh, so that the same user can encrypt it or the same collective uh, 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 set of users that have access to this secret key can later on access this, uh, uh, this data. The benefits that it presents is that it's really fast uh, compared to other types of encryption, but the problem is key distribution. So how to uh, distribute this uh, secret key so that all the entitled uh, uh, recipients of information can have uh, access to this key. So in order to um, uh, avoid that problem, uh, that's the reason why uh, public key cryptography was, or asymmetric cryptography uh, uh, arose. And the use is in hiding information uh, for everyone else than the uh, intended recipient. And in this case, instead of just one sole key, we have two different keys, so a key pair uh, composed by a public key that, is, that can be used by anybody to encrypt data, and a secret key that is exclusively owned by the recipient of uh, this data. So of course the, the, the names are, are telling, so the secret key has to be kept secret only for the recipient, and whomever has this secret key can decrypt anything that is encrypted by using this public key. And whenever uh, this public key is, uh, is published in a, in a public registry or public repository, so anybody can uh, link this public key to the identity of this recipient, and encrypt data with this public key so that only this recipient can have access to the data. 
The problem that it presents is that it's relatively slow compared to uh, symmetric encryption, and normally it is uh, used to uh, perform the key distribution, so perform the symmetric key distribution, and uh, negotiate uh, the key that is used then for a symmetrically encrypted channel uh, between two points. And therefore, you have the, the benefits from both in terms of uh, efficiency and in terms of uh, a facility of, uh, of, of key distribution or, or easiness of key distribution. And it can also be used in a reversed way, so reversing the roles of the recipient and the sender to enable digital signatures uh, to prove that the originator of some information is actually this recipient, because only this recipient with his or key, his or secret key, can produce the signature or a given proof uh, that uh, given data uh, was produced by him or her. So uh, there are there's another classification of um, uh, of uh, encryption mechanisms. There is between deterministic and probabilistic. So deterministic encryption is the uh, the typical encryption that is used uh, in uh, for, for uh, symmetric key. Uh, that's, uh, for example, the case of uh, AES. But it's also the case for uh, for RSA in uh, public key crypto. It's the, the main crypto system used to, to uh, do most of the, the key exchanges and uh, uh, and also for uh, for signing uh, emails, for example, for, for PEP and, and secure email. And uh, in this case, what deterministic means is that whenever we encrypt a value, the output will always be the same. So the encryption will always look the same. So the encryption of a 5 here, if it has this form, it will always have this form. If we encrypt a 5, we'll always come up with this. If we encrypt a 10, we'll come up with a different thing, but always the same uh, different thing. So this means that if we have a database of, uh, for example, of age, and we have uh, six, uh, so 60% of the, the records uh, have a 5, and 40% of the records have a 10, and this is something that can be uh, known by an attacker, because it's like general population statistics, uh, deterministic encryption will produce a database that looks like this, where uh, an attacker can see that a value occurs six times and another value occurs uh, four times. So it's possible for an attacker, just by looking at the frequency of appearance of the encrypted terms, to break the encryption and bring back the, the map it back to the original data. So this is the, the main problem with deterministic encryption, so the, the uh, exposure to frequency attacks. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, if the, the system uh, doesn't have to provide any kind of matching functionality, uh, it should always be uh, protected. To avoid this is uh, the reason why uh, probabilistic encryption uh, uh, was uh, produced or invented. And probabilistic encryption, uh, besides the input data that is encrypted, it adds also a salt, a random uh, noise to the encryption, so that the encryption of the same number always looks different. And this is what is called semantic security. So it's not possible for an attacker to tell whether these two encryptions are encryptions of the same or a different uh, input. So this has the benefit of avoiding any uh, frequency attacks, but uh, the, the problem is that uh, it's not possible to match, uh, so to, to have uh, equality comparisons between encrypted data. So another mechanism has to be in place in order to do that. Uh, so going forward, uh, the next step is homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a special type of uh, encryption that enables computations directly on encrypted data. In a public key infrastructure uh, setting where we have a public key and a secret key, a homomorphic encryption also has or can have a operation keys uh, beyond the public key that can be also considered part of the, the publicly uh, published uh, keys or the publicly available uh, keys. And these evaluation keys can be given to a third party that will be able to perform some computation, in this case is a generic function f of the inputs x, y, in such a way that if the sender encrypts the individual data, or we have multiple senders that encrypt their own inputs uh, under this, uh, this public key, then this third party can perform this computation by applying the properties of the, of the crypto system and end up with an encryption that is actually the encryption of the function of the inputs. And in all these process, no decryption happens. So the, this third party doesn't have access to any data in the clear. Uh, finally, the recipient, so the, the owner of the secret key, can decrypt the results uh, without having to perform the computation. So this brings uh, many options and many uh, dimensions on how to outsource data or how to enable 
uh, computations on data by parties that are not necessarily trustworthy. And the, the first uh, image that comes to mind when speaking about this kind of outsourced computation is the cloud. So what happens if we want to outsource data to the cloud? So we have several options here. We either fully trust the cloud, and then we send the data uh, through a secure pipeline, of course, but securing the communications is something easy, something that has been uh, solved through traditional cryptography. Uh, we can put the data in the cloud in the clear. If there are multiple tenants, multiple users from the cloud, they can also send their data. It's very easy to have data sharing. Computing across data that comes from different users is also very easy, but this will never happen because the, the cloud will never store or process or will never store data in the clear. And uh, it might happen also that the, the customers, the users of the cloud, will not trust the cloud to have their data in the clear and access it uh, as, as, uh, as happily as with this model. Uh, so in order to avoid that, uh, the option and to avoid also that uh, the, the cloud can be uh, or can leak uh, some data or some, uh, uh, let's say, hacker can just reach into the cloud and obtain, have access to this data, uh, we can have this model where all the data that's stored in the cloud is encrypted, but the keys belong to the cloud. So it's the cloud, the one that manages uh, the keys. This means that uh, the cloud is, uh, again, fully trusted because the, the cloud operator can still decrypt the data, but you have one more, uh, let's say, um, a shield or one more protection against uh, external attackers because the data, while it is stored, it is encrypted. Again, data sharing is easy because the, the cloud can decrypt the data and operate on data that comes from different customers. Uh, then we come to the usual case, uh, especially uh, in, uh, a, for, for uh, a applications that deal with uh, sensitive data and personal data, the cloud is normally not trusted. And in this case, it's not enough by encrypting the data. It's, uh, it's also needed that it's the user, the one that controls the keys and, and has have the full management on the keys and controls who can decrypt and who can have access uh, to the data. In this case, if we use traditional encryption, then all the data that is stored in the cloud is encrypted. So the cloud cannot decrypt, but the cloud cannot also do any kind of computation on the data. So any cloud benefits that, uh, that can be produced by a typical uh, software service or, or application service uh, stored in the cloud or, or provided by the cloud are completely lost. So if a user wants to compute on the data or has some results on the data, uh, he or she has to download the data, process it locally, and then uh, he can encrypt the results again and send them back to the cloud. So in order to uh, preserve these functionalities and these services that the cloud can offer while guaranteeing the same data, the same level of protection as in this scenario where the cloud is untrusted, is where uh, we can rely on a homomorphic encryption. And in this case, uh, let's assume a very simple for example where the user has two numbers, he has a three and has a five. Uh, they are part of, the, uh, of a database or, or a measurement that the, the customer is uh, getting constantly. And uh, he wants to send this uh, information to the cloud. He encrypts the information with the keys that, the, uh, that he himself uh, manages. Uh, the cloud has these uh, encrypted values. So the only thing that the cloud sees is uh, are uh, random uh, garbage-like uh, values. Uh, but uh, he can perform the some operation, for example, like addition uh, between these two numbers, and he can obtain the result that uh, the cloud doesn't know exactly what this result is. Uh, so it only knows that uh, uh, this is linked to the original data by uh, an addition operation, but it cannot see whether this is a 3, whether this is a 5, or this is an 8. And this result can be uh, given back to the user uh, so that uh, only this user can decrypt it. So this enables these two paths of uh, computation. So the regular path, that is having two inputs in the clear, computing on the inputs, encrypting, encrypting them, and then sending the result to an untrusted environment. Uh, but homomorphic encryption also opens this second path where the data can be encrypted, can be sent to an untrustworthy environment, and this environment can perform the computation by applying some function that is equivalent or that maps uh, this operation to the encrypted domain and obtain exactly the same results and the same functionalities as in this other path. So this is a very um, convenient way of uh, accessing cloud services and uh, outsourced uh, services in a secure way. And this means that uh, a client can have a, a 
resource constraint uh, device uh, where he stores uh, a private key. He can encrypt the information, send this information uh, coming from a uh, data source with the, the, the public key, send this, uh, all this information in encrypted way to a computation host, perform some heavy computation there, and get back the encrypted result without leaking any information to, uh, to this uh, high performance computing infrastructure or a uh, much more powerful infrastructure than the, the client device. One more level uh, of uh, homomorphic encryption, because right now I've just put the, the example of the addition. And this is very simple, again, it's a, it's a toy example. But if we want to go farther and we want to uh, execute anything uh, in an unattended way in a third party, it's outsourced uh, all computation to the cloud, uh, this is what fully homomorphic encryption does. So that's the difference. I will, I will come back again to this difference between homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, it enables to completely uh, do arbitrary computations on the on a trusted environment uh, just by relying on the homomorphic properties of the crypto system. This was uh, first proposed or first uh, proven that it was uh, uh, theoretically achievable in 2009. Uh, and after that, uh, many implementations, many practical implementations followed. And uh, this is one of the most important uh, uh, computer science breakthrough, breakthrough and computer security uh, breakthrough of the 21st century. Uh, the difference is that it, the, the computation model for homomorphic encryption for homomorphic computation is relatively, it's kind of different from the uh, usual computation model for data in the clear. Uh, so examples here uh, involve, for example, uh, bank transactions sent for uh, anti-money laundering uh, checks without uh, exposing uh, the information from the, the financial records, uh, securely uh, store and query a large sensitive database in the cloud, so outsourcing all the, the resources needed for all the logic uh, for the, the database to a cloud where, where uh, this operation might uh, bring some cost uh, effectiveness. And uh, outsourced credit monitoring uh, and so on. So there are many uh, applications where uh, this might come in handy. Uh, plus, there's also one more risk uh, that is not necessarily related to, uh, to privacy alone, but uh, that has been kind of floating around uh, in the last uh, years, there is the, the promise of quantum computing. And uh, it's, re it's very relevant right now because just uh, uh, last month, uh, well, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there was this uh, publication in the media about uh, Google uh, claiming that they had uh, achieved the quantum supremacy. So they had achieved a computer that could perform an operation in uh, time with response time uh, that is uh, that would be completely impossible and achievable for any other computation resources with uh, traditional computation with no non quantum uh, computation the uh, the main implications that this has on uh, cryptography is that most of the systems most of, most of the crypto systems for public crypto that are used nowadays uh, are not uh, resilient to uh, these kind of quantum computers. So integer factoring, there is a typical uh, problem for RSA, so this is one of the most widespread crypto systems, uh, uh, discrete logs, and some other problems uh, related to these two uh, can be broken in polynomial time, so in, in a feasible time frame uh, with a quantum computer. So whenever these uh, quantum computers arrive and are mass produced, uh, most of the public key crypto that is used right now will be completely broken. And this is uh, um, I mean, a very serious uh, issue, uh, especially when dealing with uh, data that has to be protected long term. Like, for example, in the, in the health domain, omics data is something that cannot be modified, that uh, persists uh, through the whole lifetime of, a, of an individual and also affects uh, his descendants and his industry or her descendants and industry. ancestry. So for this kind of uh, very sensitive data that has to be protected long term, uh, the fact that uh, public key crypto can be broken, or a big um, a chunk of public key crypto can be broken, uh, is a serious uh, issue. Hopefully, uh, there are also candidates uh, for uh, protecting a, a data in a way that uh, it can still be resilient against uh, quantum computers. And one of those uh, approaches, one of those techniques that can be used is uh, based on lattice cryptography. And it turns out that uh, lattice cryptography is also one of the main enablers for 
homomorphic crypto. So both things are very tightly linked together. So lattice cryptography is uh, yeah, the use of conjecture hard problems, so the same as traditional crypto can, can work on, on uh, discrete log or the hardness of uh, factoring the integers. Uh, lattice cryptography is based on hard problems related to lattices. And lattices are, are uh, nothing else than uh, a set of uh, points in uh, vector space, so a set of, of points uh, that are uh, distributed across the integers, for example. And uh, it presents uh, resistance to quantum attacks. Again, it's conjecture. But it is uh, resistant to, to quantum attacks. A high asymptotic efficiency and parallelism. So whenever operations is, is, uh, are implemented on that is based crypto are embarrassingly uh, parallelizable. So they can be easy, very easily uh, parallelized. Security and the worst case intractability assumptions and uh, very powerful and versatile cryptographic objects. Among them, homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. So, uh, just to give you an intuition on uh, how Lattice uh, Crypto works, uh, encryption and decryption are basically linear transforms. So, the, if we see the plain text space are as points in, uh, for example, here a very simple two-dimensional space. So, we have two coordinates x, y, and each of these points can be represented and we can represent a one plain text input. What encryption does is transform each of these points to a point in this. Uh, let's say squashed lattice, uh, where it is much more difficult to know uh, which are the, the closest points or which are the points that are uh, in the neighborhood of, uh, of other points. Uh, so this uh, determination of which points are in the neighborhood or which points are closer to a point uh, is the basis for the hard problems that uh, protect uh, the or are the basis for a uh, lattice crypto. And if we start uh, with, this, uh, with this representation uh, of a lattice as a, as a set of points, uh, we know that, uh, for example, if we have um, a, a decoding problem where any point that is closer to this point can be decoded to this point in lattice, so only the uh, yellow points here are lattice points uh, because they are uniformly uh, spread out according to the basis uh, of the lattice. And whatever point falls in here, can be brought back to this lattice point. So this is uh, a decoding uh, problem. It's the, the, the um, closest vector problem uh, or the shortest vector problem. And what encryption does is taking one of these points in lattice that can be chosen at random and code in this small vector here that when added to this point, takes it to another point that is still in the same region, so that it will be decoded back to this point, and it codes the message plus some random noise in this vector here, so in this difference between these points. So this is an encryption, this is a lattice point, and the message is coded in this difference between these two, uh, these two points. So this means that together with the message, there's also some noise, that is what gives the, the, the randomness, the semantic security that, uh, that I have mentioned also before, and that makes this, uh, this decoding difficult. And if we have two different points and we add them due to the linear properties of lattices, uh, we will also have uh, a point that is just uh, the addition of these two points and for which the message will also be the addition of the messages. So this is where the homomorphism comes from. So adding these two points means that the underlying message that is coded in this difference is also added together. But the noises that were added in these two uh, encryptions are also added. So this means that the noise increases. Uh, so after each of homomorphic operation, the noise grows. And whenever we are within this region, we are fine because the decoding will work correctly and the decryption will be correct. But as soon as we breach this, this, uh, this zone, so we go out of the, the correct decryption area, the correct decoding area, then uh, the decryption will fail. And we are basically exhausting the homomorphic capacity of the, of the crypto system. So this decryption radius, so this, uh, this radius of this area is what can be linked or what can be interpreted as this homomorphic capacity. Uh, and of course, this is related to uh, how many operations or how many consecutive operations can be executed under homomorphic encryption and how versatile a, cryptos, a homomorphic uh, crypto system uh, can be. If we want to go to the fully homomorphic encryption, uh, because 
this of course is not fully homomorphic because there's a cap, there's a limit to the number of operations that can be executed. So this is called somewhat homomorphic, and this is what we mean here by SHE. So here we have uh, a, for a somewhat homomorphic encryption system, we have key generation, and encryption, decryption, and also an evaluation that brings these addition or multiplication operations uh, from the plaintext to the, the ciphertext. Uh, so through this evaluation function, if we are able to evaluate the decryption circuit under a homomorphic encryption, we can basically decrypt under encryption. This means that if we have this encryption that is only valid when the function fits within this homomorphic capacity, we keep evaluating on here, we grow the noise, and we arrive to a point where the, the capacity is almost exhausted. If we manage to uh, bring this decryption function also as part of this evaluation, and we can run a kind of squash this decryption function in uh, as an evaluation that can be performed and can fit the, the uh, noise that is added within this uh, bound, so this remaining capacity that we have here, it's possible to decrypt and obtain a fresh ciphertext without actually decrypting, because it's still a homomorphic operation. And if we just keep doing this, we, have, we can have infinite operations. We can have arbitrary number of consecutive operations. And this is how fully homomorphic encryption is achieved. So this was the main breakthrough that uh, Craig Gentry brought in 2009. Uh, and this is what uh, makes the difference between a somewhat homomorphic encryption that can perform additions, multiplications, or both, and a fully homomorphic encryption that can perform an arbitrary number of uh, operations. Uh, and this is called uh, bootstrapping. So just to make it clear, uh, because normally there's a, a misconception uh, between uh, what homomorphic encryption and what fully homomorphic encryption is, normally, uh, fully, uh, when normally homomorphic encryption is directly associated to fully homomorphic encryption, there's a clear distinction between both. And this distinction comes from how efficient this bootstrapping operation is. So somewhat homomorphic encryption is what is typically used in all practical applications. And this means that uh, for most practical applications, it's possible to determine which is the depth of the function, which is the depth of the operation that we want to perform on the encrypted data. Whenever that's the case, the crypto system can be parameterized to enable for this homomorphic capacity and be able to execute the whole function without the need to bootstrap. And this homomorphic computation can be really fast. Parallelization can, uh, can really bring the, the computational overhead uh, and also the, the cipher expansion, so how big the cipher is with respect to the plaintext, to very low ratios and make it really, really efficient. And these are the practical uh, crypto systems that are used nowadays. So any practical instantiation of uh, homomorphic computation uh, typically relies on somewhat homomorphic encryption. On the other hand, fully homomorphic encryption is the promise. So this means that any operation can be performed, an arbitrary set of operations can be performed. Uh, we can basically substitute a uh, processor that we have in, in our computers by a virtual processor that works with uh, homomorphic primitives and uh, processes encrypted data the same way as we could process clear text data. The problem is that the computational overhead of these techniques, and in particular of bootstrapping, comes at a high cost. So the computational overhead is really, really high, uh, at least compared with the other uh, homomorphic operations. And this means that nowadays, fully homomorphic encryption is still a promise. So, uh, a lot of advances uh, have been uh, brought to, to reality and to practice in the, in the last uh, five to ten years in, in this uh, in this uh, area, uh, but it's not yet there. So it's not really uh, completely uh, ready to market. But on the other hand, some of the encryption is, and uh, I will show that also in one of the, the practical applications. Uh, so then, how do we measure security? in these uh, crypto systems. Because for traditional crypto, normally security is tied to the key length. So the bigger the keys, the more secure the crypto system is. So if, uh, if um, the computational resources of attackers grow every year, uh, we just have to increase the size of the keys and we are safe again for the next uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, so this is the typical approach for, uh, uh, for the security achieved by the, the traditional uh, crypto schemes. And uh, this has worked up now but uh, for, this is just a heuristic, a heuristic, so this is not a real measure of the security. The real measure of the security is how hard it is for an attacker to break the, the crypto system in terms of extracting the key, so obtaining the key, or uh, decrypting 
So obtaining the cipher, the, the plain text that uh, corresponds to a ciphertext without having access to the key. Uh, so this is what really determines the security of a, of a crypto system. And security in lattice schemes can be captured also with uh, an equivalent measure to the key length. This is called bits of security. And this boils down to how difficult it is to perform brute force attacks on lattice problems. And just to give you an idea, this in terms in the in a homomorphic encryption doesn't depend solely on the size of the keys, but also on the homomorphic capacity, because now we have one more dimension that is the evaluation function that, it, that can be performed under encryption. And in this sense, we, we have not only the security parameter that is plotted here in this axis, but also the size of the computation that is supported. And this means that uh, the uh, size of the, the actual size of encryptions and the actual security uh, is not always uh, directly or, or trivially uh, related to each other. And this represents, for example, the, the colors here represent how fast uh, or how efficient the homomorphic operations are on encryptions. If we increase the size of the computation that is supported, of course, encryptions become bigger and become slower. And if we increase the security parameter on the other side, Encryptions also, so the operations also become uh, slower and more difficult to perform. Uh, and it's also true that uh, with a very small security parameter, uh, it's not possible to achieve a very high uh, uh, computation margin for the for the homomorphic capacity. So these two are very tied together. And whenever uh, uh, um, uh, an implementer or a developer uh, has to fine tune the security parameters of the crypto system, uh, for the case of homomorphic encryption, he has to take into account also the homomorphic capacities and the computation that will take place by using this, uh, this encryption. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, one of the, the benefits of, uh, of these lattice-based uh, crypto systems, in particular the, the uh, somewhat fully homomorphic crypto system based on lattices, is that uh, they are resistant to quantum attacks. So uh, some time ago, already, uh, Shaw showed that uh, there exist quantum algorithms for factoring so again, whenever uh, the, the promise of uh, quantum computers becomes to reality, becomes real, uh, it will be possible to break integer factoring, it will be possible to break discrete logs, and uh, most of the public crypto will be broken. Uh, on the other hand, uh, modern lattice encryption is built based on the hardness of this shorter, uh, shorter spectral problem, so determining uh, which is the vector uh, that leads you to the closest vector in the, in the lattice. So the problem that I uh, mentioned before about decoding an arbitrary point to the closest point in the, in the lattice. And the best known quantum result to solve this problem is exponential in the size of the, of the lattice. So this n represents the, the dimensionality of the lattice, so the, the, the size of the lattice. And um, it has been uh, shown that the best quantum result that uh, can solve this vector, uh, the shorter vector problem, is still exponential on this parameter. Uh, Again, in any case, as, as uh, always happens in, in crypto, uh, cryptography and cryptology so is a cat mouse and mouse problem. Uh, so right now, this is a conjecture that there are no quantum attacks that can efficiently uh, solve in polynomial time the uh, shortest vector problem. But uh, it might happen in the future as, uh, as uh, uh, the same as, as it was conjectured for RSA or it was conjectured for other uh, classical problems. Uh, it might happen that there's a, a new attack that, that breaks up, but again, it has been conjectured and it has not been discovered uh, for the last uh, 30 years. So uh, this is kind of a, a I mean, uh, it can reassure uh, that, uh, uh, that these problems based on lattices uh, are resilient. And a proof of that is that, for example, NIST is uh, currently standardizing the uh, main candidates for a post-quantum crypto. So it is mature enough uh, for, for being standardized. Uh, so how we translate uh, uh, programs to secure programs that can be executed under homomorphic encryption. So I, I, told, uh, I said before that the computation model is uh, essentially different from the regular traditional uh, computation model in the video text. And this uh, is because we have to map uh, these two main uh, operations, so integer addition and uh, integer uh, products or polynomial convolutions to the operations that are available in the ciphertext that are basically additions between ciphertext and multiplications between ciphertexts. Uh, so whenever operation that we have 
in the, the code for our plain text algorithm has to be translated into these two main primitives, addition and multiplication. Of course, conditional branching, so conditional if-else uh, statements are not possible on encrypted data because it's not possible to take decisions on the encrypted data because these decisions are not available in the clear. So the, the, the conditions are not available in the clear. And in the particular case that the addition and the multiplication work in a binary uh, ring, so we have the, the addition is an XOR uh, between two bits and the multiplication is an AND between two bits, then we have binary gates and we have a general purpose uh, computer, a general purpose processor. And this mimics exactly the same uh, mode of operation of, uh, of current uh, uh, computer processors. So the second problem, uh, besides this translation to, to encrypted primitives, to, to addition multiplication primitives, is uh, how we code the inputs, how, how the input messages can be coded in order to be useful and under, under encryption. And this means that they have to be translated into the algebraic form of the plaintext. And as I told before, these plaintexts are basically polynomials with integer coefficients. So the inputs, if they are lists of real numbers, uh, emails in, in ASCII text, uh, images, or any other source of information, it has to be coded in terms of these integer vectors or polynomials. And once that this is coded into a, a plaintext, then it can be encrypted and we can perform the computation, the skew computation with the two operations, the two primitives that I have shown before. The result can be decrypted and we need also a decoding step that brings it back to the original format. Uh, so yeah, I, I will go into the, into the details here. Uh, the third uh, dimension here that has to be taken into account when translating clear text programs to encrypted programs is the parameterization. And normally there's a, a tension between the specific configurations for crypto applications and generic configurations for typical math libraries or, or uh, uh, signal processing libraries or image processing libraries uh, or in general, yeah, math libraries. And for crypto specific parameters are the scheme selection, so what kind of encryption system is used, and in particular right now there are uh, two, three main uh, homomorphic crypto systems based on Lattice crypto that are uh, currently most widespread for, for applications. One of them is called uh, FB or BFB, uh, can deal with integer arithmetic, uh, so kind of fixed point computation on integers, and uh, the uh, CKKS, uh, there's the, the other main uh, crypto system, can deal with uh, complex arithmetic or approximate uh, arithmetic. Uh, so kind of approaching floating point, but uh, not yet, not, not exactly there. And the, the system interaction configuration deals with uh, how the uh, program is optimized for the architecture in which it is, it is executed. And in this case, uh, for math intensive libraries, normally, they are already quite optimized for uh, giving architectures with uh, vector operations and taking advantage of the preemptive execution in, in, the, in the processors and taking advantage of how, uh, as many available threads or cores as possible to parallelize and to achieve uh, the, the most of the, the processing capabilities of the, of the computer. In terms of lattice operations, uh, this also involves how the elements are coded, uh, how parallelism can be applied both at the math layer, so at the level of the polynomials, uh, at the lattice layer, so at the, the ring uh, level, the, the, the operations between uh, polynomials, uh, and in the circuit execution itself. So after this overview of what homomorphic encryption is, uh, how it works, and what are the main computation models, that uh, allow to enable, enable the translation between uh, clear text programs to encrypted programs, uh, we can talk about uh, how mature this technology is and how it has been come into the, how it has been, uh, let's say, progressed uh, to the market right now. And the two main limitations uh, or the two main uh, barriers that have, uh, let's say, limited or, or hindered the, the adoption of homomorphic encryption right now in practical applications are, on the one hand, this difficulty on translating the computation model and the, the sometimes the, the restricted uh, computation model in terms of the available operations. Uh, so 
some versatility uh, is, uh, so is lagging on in terms of versatility depending on the applications. And on the, uh, the second big element is the lack of standardization. So up to now, uh, lattice-based crypto, post-quantum crypto was not standardized, homomorphic encryption was not standardized. Uh, so all these schemes uh, lived mostly in the academic world and uh, they were not brought to a state that could be mature enough to, uh, to uh, translate them into, into uh, market-valid uh, products. This has changed in the last uh, years, and specifically in 2017, uh, this uh, standardization group was created. Uh, so this is an, an ad hoc uh, uh, consortium uh, that was created joining both academia, industry, and several relevant uh, uh, standardization bodies uh, together to uh, bring homework encryption uh, as a privacy standard. And this uh, is meant to enable uh, all the operations that can be uh, facilitated by homework encryption to derive value from data while protecting privacy. Uh, the main web page of this consortium is homeworkencryption.org. Uh, there you can find the latest version of the, of the standards, the details about the, the consortium composition, the latest meetings that have uh, uh, taken place in the last uh, two years. And normally this consortium uh, gathers together in biannual uh, meetings since uh, it was created in 2017. Uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of the engagement and the weight of this uh, consortium, it brings together uh, institutions from all around the globe, uh, uh, ranging from the USA, Canada, Korea, Japan, China, Singapore, and uh, many other countries also here in Europe. Uh, in terms of industry uh, presence in this consortium, we have very big players like Intel, Microsoft, uh, IBM, Samsung, uh, Mastercard, SAP, uh, plus uh, many startups that are working also in producing uh, practical solutions for uh, homework encryption like Duality or Infer. Uh, we have also uh, government institutions like the Korean Credit Bureau, uh, NIST at the US, the US Department of Defense, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, well, the Canadian uh, offices for, for security. And there's also the presence of academia as the main engine that brings new innovations, or innovations to the to this uh, dimension, uh, ranging from MIT, San Diego, Stanford, uh, New Jersey, uh, EPFL uh, here in Switzerland, or Holloway, and many more. So the standards meeting ha meetings have uh, taken place since 2017, July 2017, uh, at Microsoft Research in Redmond, uh, Cambridge, Toronto, Santa Clara. And uh, for the next meeting that will be scheduled in spring 2020, uh, the other side of, of the pond is also being considered as one of the potential venues for that. So it might take place also uh, either in Europe or uh, in uh, Asia. Uh, and again, if you want to stay informed, uh, you can join this Google group uh, announcement at homeworkingcryption.org. And there you can have the latest uh, announcements and the latest news about uh, the developments of this, uh, of this consortium. So, what are the outcomes of, uh, of these meetings and what has been produced in terms of standards uh, from, from this consortium uh, is basically uh, three different uh, dimensions. One is uh, uh, security standards. So as I told you before, determining the security of a lattice-based crypto system is not trivial and it doesn't follow the same paradigm or the same heuristic about uh, key size as traditional crypto systems do. So one of the main uh, outcomes, one of the main uh, 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 activities that uh, that this group has um, has been pursuing, uh, has been carrying out during the last years, is trying to get a standardized set of parameters that determine which is the uh, how to uh, parameterize uh, these remote encryption crypto systems for a given level of bit security. And this bit security can be, for example, 128 bits, this is the, the current recommended NISA standard, uh, 298, 192, 256. And here you can see that uh, uh, these two, the N and log Q, are kind of the main parameters of the crypto system that determine the dimension of the lattice, so the, the degree of the used polynomials, and the size of the polynomial coefficients. Uh, so these two uh, both play a role and have influence on security. And by fine-tuning these two, and fine-tuning also the distribution of the key and the distribution of the noise that is used, um, these levels can be achieved. But the value of these tables is that it's possible to directly go here, uh, take the recommended parameters, 
and come up with a configured system that is ready to go. Uh, and this is part of this homomorphic encryption standard document, uh, of which the latest version dates, from, dates back from uh, January 7th of this year, but it, this is a living document uh, that anybody can comment on. And again, all the links are, are available uh, here at this page, homomorphencryption.org. Uh, the other two uh, axes or the other two dimensions of, uh, of uh, actions for, for uh, this standardization consortium deals with the API, so fostering interoperability between uh, different uh, applications or different uh, crypto systems. Uh, so and this is, again, a, quite a difficult uh, a task because the uh, crypto systems were just part of the, the academic productions or scientific publications, but uh, they have not been put in a format like an RFC-like format uh, that can ease the, the interoperability uh, and the specifications on how these crypto systems, how uh, encryption should look like uh, when it is uh, implemented, uh, or how the, the an encryption or a decryption uh, should be called. Uh, and uh, the third uh, pillar is uh, deals with the applications and the uptake on and usage of uh, homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. So how these uh, APIs can be integrated into systems to enable uh, new business models and new applications that um, can process uh, private data or sensitive data without leaking it to the, to the processing entity. Uh, so again, if you are interested, you can get involved by joining uh, uh, any of these groups. Uh, so the announcement is the main uh, general group for, for uh, announcements about the activities of the consortium. Uh, the standards deals with uh, official standards discussion. Uh, libraries uh, deals with uh, specific uh, libraries and implementations for the, for the different crypto systems and the different instantiations. And the governance uh, deals with uh, discussions about how to move on and, and how uh, which are the, the strategic lines and the main targets of this uh, consortium. Uh, so taking into account that you don't need a Google email account to join uh, these groups, so uh, these are open to anybody. And if you want to contact the, the consortium, just uh, drop an email to contact at horvencryption.org. Uh, uh, going uh, to the second aspect of uh, practicality. Uh, so this effort uh, has been pursued during the last two years also because the, the uh, availability of uh, practical libraries that implemented, instantiated a homomorphic encryption crypto system it kind of exploded in the last few years. Uh, so this is a, a quite comprehensive list of the main available libraries that implement the, at least the, mod, the most widespread uh, lattice-based uh, crypto systems together with their homomorphic uh, functionalities. And these are uh, Helib. This is uh, one of the first uh, libraries that was implemented uh, from IBM. Uh, Seal, that is produced by, by Microsoft. Uh, Palisade, uh, produced by Duality, so one startup um, based in the US. Uh, the FEW or TFHE, these are two different libraries. One of them, the TFHE, is also produced by Infer, which is a, a startup based here in Switzerland. Uh, we have also HIAN, produced by uh, Seoul National University. Uh, Law, the NFL, uh, produced by uh, the European the outcome of uh, the European Heat project, uh, and mainly supported by a, a research group in, in uh, Toulouse, and uh, the Ku uh, the Ku uh, which is uh, which explores explore, sorry uh, explores also the use of uh, GPUs for uh, implementing these crypto systems and taking advantage of the uh, embarrass, embarrassingly parallel uh, properties uh, of these homomorphic operations. Uh, to implement them in a very efficient way using GPUs, using general purpose GPUs, GP GPUs. And finally, uh, <coughs> we have also uh, Latigo, uh, that is a uh, lattice based cryptography uh, library based uh, written in Go. So most of your libraries, if not all, are uh, produced in C, C, uh, due to efficient reasons, of course. Uh, but the target of this uh, Latigo library is a bit different. And before I go into how it works, so this is a product of EPFL. Uh, what we have been working in the last uh, year uh, in our group. Uh, before I go into details of what Latigo uh, enables, uh, let me first uh, um, take a step back and uh, go back to this slide where we have all the different uh, approaches, technology approaches to uh, protect data during computation. And 
besides homomorphic encryption, the other software-based approach was secure multivalent invitation. So up to now, we have uh, seen that homomorphic encryption is kind of a paradigmatic case for outsourced computation. So you encrypt, send the data to an outsourced or untrustworthy uh, a computational uh, a, a service, and you, give, you can uh, get back the results, again, in encrypted form. Nothing is leaked to this uh, outsourced party. Secure multiparty computation enables distributed environments. And I'll go into that first before uh, going into the Latigo library. So the main problem statement for secure multiparty computation is uh, a set of players. So in this figure here, we have five different players. Each of them uh, has uh, its own input, x1 to x5. And they want to compute a function f uh, that gives some results, y1 to yn. Uh, this means that uh, this party obtains y1, this party obtains y2, but it must be the case that all of them obtain, obtain the same result and it is uh, broadcast to, to, to all of them. With the requirements that, uh, from the privacy standpoint, no party should learn anything more than the output that it gets and what can be inferred from that output. And from the standpoint of correctness, each party must be guaranteed that the output that it receives is correct. So it's actually the output of this f function, even if all the computation happens in oblivious sense, in oblivious uh, way. And this is achieved through interactive protocols. So interchange uh, between the different parties of random information or information that uh, looks like uh, random uh, in such a way that after uh, all this computation happens and all these random values are interchanged, then the results are produced and each party obtains the uh, correct result uh, of the computation that corresponds to this vector. Uh, so this is uh, possible. Uh, this has been known for uh, well, since the 80s. Uh, there have been protocols implementing this kind of secure multiparty computation. Uh, it has been brought to some uh, practical applications. There are some companies also that, that uh, have commercial systems uh, based on a secure multiparty computation, uh, and it has been used. I mean, it's, it's, it's currently commercialized, so it's uh, it's quite mature, uh, we could say. Uh, but the drawback that it presents with respect to homomorphic encryption is the high communication overhead. Of course, all this computation between the different parties comes at a cost. And if the parties cannot be always online, uh, or they cannot be present during the computation, then uh, this uh, cooperation breaks and the function cannot be computed. Uh, this is uh, together with the fact that uh, normally one of the security assumptions and the trust assumptions of these schemes is that uh, no parties uh, collude together. So if parties collude, they might also obtain some extra information uh, beyond what they are what they obtain as a result of the, of the computation. So the thing is. Commorph encryption is uh, a communication efficient. It has a non-negligible, or it can have a non-negligible uh, computation overhead. Secure multiparty computation, on the other hand, is computationally quite efficient, but it presents a non-negligible non uh, communication overhead. And we are talking about data sharing, and data sharing is an inherently distributed setting where that we can actually map to this scenario. We have several input parties with their own data, and they want to compute the data um, uh, result uh, collectively on all these uh, databases. And for that, we can bring together a homomorphic encryption and multiparty computation. And this is actually what can produce these hybrid-like uh, uh, solutions, uh, is what can pr uh, produce uh, very efficient, and very effective uh, uh, solutions for protecting the data in this kind of data sharing and distributed environments. And this is exactly the purpose of this uh, Natigo library. And this is also the reason why uh, it is implemented in Go language instead of C, C++. So we are not only targeting uh, the, the um, uh, uh, producing efficient uh, solutions, but easing the deployment of distributed uh, computing solutions, uh, embedding both uh, multi-party protocols, secure multi-party protocols, together with the uh, uh, flexibility and the availability of an attended processing for uh, that is uh, brought, up, brought out by uh, homomorphic computation. So by bringing these two uh, things together, uh, we can uh, have first the same outsourced model of computation. So where we encrypt some data, we obtain the encrypted data, we send this data to the cloud, the cloud can perform the evaluation, uh, return the still encrypted result, 
and bring back the results to the rightful uh, owner of the secret key so that it can decrypt it. And for this, we have the typical schemes, the BFD and CKKS, that are the two most widespread uh, crypto systems dealing with integer arithmetic and uh, approximate arithmetic or complex arithmetic. And at the same time, we can also enable, and this is what makes it different, what makes it different from the other uh, usual cryptographic libraries, that we can also enable this kind of distributed computation in a much more flexible model where we can also rely on an outsourced computation. If it's a high performance computing infrastructure uh, or a cloud infrastructure where the computation is more cost effective than uh, at the premises of each of these sites, uh, we don't need all of them to be online during the computation. And all these is, are benefits that enable practical and useful applications uh, for um, uh, dealing with and for processing uh, private data coming from different institutions uh, in a way that they are not disclosed either to the cloud, either to the processor, or uh, to, the, uh, to the other parties. And for that, we have also the distributed protocols on top of the, the BFB and CKDS. Uh, this brings also the post-quantum security uh, from the, the lattice-based crypto systems. And uh, uh, we're also working on, on uh, improving uh, post-quantum key exchange and uh, providing a, a more flexible, more easy to use uh, secure multipath implementation engine that can directly translate uh, this cooperation between multiple sites and this computation on data coming from multiple sites in a program that can be run directly uh, and deployed and easily deployed uh, in a plurality of sites or, and or uh, in an outsourced server. Uh, so coming back to, to this figure again, uh, now that we have gone through both homomorphic encryption and multipath implementation, uh, so we have an idea on the, the main uh, software-based solutions for uh, protecting data during computation, both in outsourced and distributed environments, uh, we can deal with the uh, data release. And uh, I will go in the next slides through the, the differential privacy framework and how it can be applied to protect uh, data release. The uh, the main motivation and the main risk that differential privacy tries to address is uh, the fact that uh, the de-identification of the data does not protect uh, these data from inference attacks. And this is especially true for high dimensional data. In the health, for example, we have omics data that is very high dimensional. Uh, it is inherently identifiable, but in the, in the financial uh, scenario and in Many other scenarios, whenever we deal with large scale data sets and, and uh, big data, um, it is impossible to fully de identify or fully anonymize uh, a data set. And doing that would mean that the data set would be completely useless. Because if it becomes fully anonymous, then we are breaking the link to the actual information coming from the, uh, from the individuals. Uh, so we are kind of, uh, avoiding this information to really be used in the result or have an impact on the result of a computation. So aggregated data are also susceptible to membership and reconstruction attacks. Membership attacks meaning determining whether uh, a data of a user uh, was uh, employed, was part of the data set that was input to a computation. And reconstruction attacks meaning uh, inferring further information about the record of an individual uh, that goes beyond what the attacker has already. And both these attacks are possible uh, even with aggregated data, and even with uh, partially de-identified data. Uh, so in order to avoid that uh, or to mitigate uh, this, this issue is where uh, differential privacy comes into play. The informal notion of differential privacy says that if we have two databases that are exactly the same and we just want to see what's the impact of bringing one new individual uh, to the database, if we perform an analysis on this database and we get the result with and without this individual, then these two results will be significantly or, or mostly the same. They will not differ uh, substantially. And this translated to the effects on, the, on, the, on this individual, on this user, means that if there's already some risk of revealing a secret uh, of this individual, then this risk will not be made worse off by uh, releasing this result because the, the impact uh, of this individual in the computation is negligible or is made negligible. And this is normally achieved by uh, randomizing the output of the, of the computation. So instead of having the exact result of an analysis, uh, and I promise that this is the only formula they will show in the, the, the presentation, 
uh, we get uh, a source of uh, random noise that is added to this result, so it's kind of blurred. And this noise uh, is what makes that the distribution of this result and the distribution of this result are sufficiently close together to uh, make the inference attack substantially more difficult. And this is measured by this ratio uh, that determines uh, which is the distribution, so the, the probability mass or the probability density uh, for the result when the uh, uh, user is present and uh, when the user is not present in the database. Uh, normally, this is measured by this parameter, this uh, uh, parameter in the exponent, epsilon, uh, that defines which is the achieved uh, privacy level. So the, the smallest, uh, the smaller this, this parameter is, uh, the more privacy uh, uh, is achieved, because this means that this, uh, this ratio is closer together, so the both distributions are closer together, the bigger this parameter is, the more leakage uh, it happens. And this is directly related to the distortion, so the power of the noise that is added to the result. Uh, so there's a trade-off between utility and privacy when dealing with uh, this kind of, of techniques. Uh, I just want to, to devote the last uh, uh, part of the, of the presentation uh, to show you a few examples and to show how uh, all these techniques that right now, as I presented them, seem more like uh, conceptual uh, constructions how they can come to reality and how we have implemented them in actual systems that are working that, that can be deployed. Uh, in the particular cases that I will show, it's in the, in the hospital in Switzerland. It's a project that we have been running for the last uh, year and a half, and uh, that in which we are trying to uh, bring these solutions to operational settings and deploy them in hospitals so that it's possible to enable research for personalized medicine uh, in a practical way but also in a privacy-conscious way. Uh, so for this, uh, let me detail first the, the main framework uh, that we are relying on called Links. And this is a framework that brings together homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation to enable this distributed uh, privacy-conscious data sharing. Uh, and then I will go through the main tool that we have produced called METCO for cohort exploration and a machine learning application that can also be extrapolated to the financial service and to uh, execute basic machine learning operations on a private distributed data coming from different uh, data sources, data providers. So the target and the, the main advantage of, uh, of having a distributed setting is that we can uh, try to avoid single points of failure. So an outsourced computation model uh, means that we have one sole processing server, and if we are moving all the data to this processing server, it becomes a single point of failure. If it's breached, then all the data is uh, at risk. So in order to avoid that, we split this computation into what we call the collective authority. That are several servers that have to cooperate together in order to produce results or to do some computations uh, on the data. And in terms of key management, uh, the way that this works is, uh, again, by having this uh, public-private keeper at each of the servers. And instead of working with these individual keepers, uh, we work with a collective authority public key that is built as the aggregation of the public keys from each of these sites. So this means that the secret key corresponding to this key doesn't exist in the system, so nobody has this secret key. And even if one of these keys, these individual secret keys, are leaked, uh, or there's a breach and, and these, uh, these keys are leaked, uh, then as long as at least one of the secret keys is preserved private, is preserved secret, then no data encrypted under this collective key can be leaked. Uh, so this means that uh, to have a decryption, we also need the cooperation of all these servers. Uh, so they need to be uh, available and online for decryption uh, purposes. So this is an, an availability you know, trade-off that we're bringing uh, as the price to pay for having these enhanced uh, uh, trust assumptions and these uh, enhanced a collective protection of the, of the data. So if all the data in the uh, network is encrypted with this collective key, then again, we achieve these uh, collective protection guarantees. Uh, we have put this in practice in uh, this uh, project called Data Protection in Personalized Health. It is funded by one of the, the, uh, the main Swiss funding institutions in the health domain, that is the, the Personalized Health and Related Technologies, it's PHRT. It has been running since April uh, 2018. And uh, it brings together um, several domains of expertise 
uh, taking into account not only the, the uh, computer security specialists in, in privacy conscious data sharing and uh, distributed and decentralized trust and distributed ledger technologies, uh, but also the domain knowledge of the uh, geneticists and the health experts, the uh, data, anal data analysts and data scientists, and the knowledge from the Swiss Data Science Center uh, that brings also the uh, or, or tries to uh, arrive at uh, a reproducibility and guarantee reproducibility and traceability of uh, uh, data science operations. And also the health ethics and policy, because one of the main factors that determines whether a solution based on a technological solution uh, based on or trying to enable security and privacy can come to practice is that we need a dialogue and a constant communication between all the interdisciplinary uh, elements here involving not only the, the technical part, but also the human side of the of equation. That is the ethics and policy that by, by the end of the day are the ones that are producing the requirements for all these uh, technologies uh, that all these technologies have to fulfill. So the main targets of the project come through uh, balance the, the usability, scalability, and data protection trade-offs and come to a set of computing tools that can be deployed at the, at the hospitals. And again, uh, the, the hospital environment is one of the specific use cases scenarios, but the approach, the technologies, and the systems that we're using here can be easily extrapolated to other scenarios like the financial sector. Uh, so the research process in the clinical world, uh, so in the clinical research, uh, deals with two phases. Uh, the first phase is called feasibility, where a researcher determines whether there are enough patients to build a significant cohort that can bring statistically significant results for an analysis performed on those uh, data from those patients, and for research subjects, they don't have to be patients specifically, and the, the second phase that deals with the data analysis itself. So once that the cohort has been identified, then uh, the data can be uh, pulled or retrieved uh, from each of these data sets and the, analysis can, the actual analysis can start. So what we have already solved and the system we are deploying right now deals with this uh, problem of finding matching uh, individuals uh, in, the, in the distributed network. And for this, uh, what we do is uh, deploy uh, this uh, system that performs a, a loading process that brings the data from the clinical data warehouse that holds all the individual identifiable data uh, to a uh, de-identified state and encrypted state. So all the data that is uh, put here in the DMZ, in the demilitarized area of the hospital, uh, is always encrypted. And this is data that is exposed through our secure systems in, uh, that uh, implement uh, both homework encryption, multi-party computation, differential privacy, uh, to enable queries to the system and determine whether there's a match and how many patients uh, match determining inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, so I will go fast through this. Uh, but the other factor that uh, is key for, for adoption of these technologies is how these technologies can be perceived from the end users. And of course, when we deal with security and privacy, it's very difficult to make them visible because they should be transparent, per definition. So they should make their work uh, behind the curtains without affecting or without hindering the, the user operation. So it's very difficult to, to showcase uh, privacy or security in a working system. But we can show that it doesn't come in the way. It's, it, cannot, it, it doesn't get in the way of the, the, the usual operation but integrating it into uh, data models and into, into user interfaces that the end users are already used to and, and uh, uh, they know, they perfectly know. And if they see that uh, bringing these uh, additional guarantees in terms of uh, data protection uh, don't, uh, don't break the, the, the typical model or typical workflows that they apply, then is the moment where they will start considering in, in adopting these technologies. Uh, so, uh, just to give you uh, the idea of what are we implemented here, for data discovery we have counts and selects of patients in terms of databases, so it's just uh, the number of matching patients. In terms of data analysis, we can perform some basic statistics and basic machine learning tasks with the security privacy guarantees that I have detailed before of avoiding any uh, point of failure and single point of failure, having these collective uh, encryption uh, guarantees. A trust distribution through secure multi-party imputation and minimal risk of re-education by releasing data through releasing the results through uh, differential privacy. Uh, so the way that 
the system works uh, when uh, so the first phase is to load the data uh, in the databases of each of these hospitals. Again, this is also um, this can also work for cross-border uh, cooperation because all the data is kept at the hospital premises, so no data leaves the, the institution itself. And again, I say hospital, but I could say also banks or, or financial institutions here. Uh, the data is encrypted under the collective key, so the, the collectively generated public key, uh, so that it uh, has these collective protection guarantees. And whenever a researcher wants to query the system, he generates the query. This query is also encrypted under this collective key, so all the query terms are encrypted under this collective key. This query is sent to the network. The network performs the interactive protocols, uh, so it's not only a form of encryption, but also uh, uh, secure multi-party computation protocols uh, to uh, change the, the format of this query and match this query against the encrypted database that is stored at each of these sites. The final result is aggregated. And this aggregation is what leverages the homomorphic properties of the crypto system. So this can be done. This is just a, an addition, a simple addition. So an, an additively homomorphic encryption is enough to do this. And the final results can be obfuscated with differential privacy, again, applied uh, relying on the homomorphic properties of the crypto system. And uh, it can also, they can also be shuffled, the results, so that uh, we break the link to the specific institution from which the results uh, came from. The final result is still encrypted under, under the collective key. And the final step of the process uh, deals with a, a key switch, so a re-encryption of the results under the key of the researcher. So together with the query, the researcher sends also uh, the public key that he wants to, that he can use. So he owns the, the secret key. And the final result, again, through an interactive protocol, is transformed from an encryption under this key to an encryption under this key so that only the researcher can decrypt the result. So this is the general mode of operation, in this case for, for, um, for COPO discovery and very simple operations. Uh, so this is the interface uh, that brings uh, together here all the criteria and all the, the terms that the clinicians can choose uh, to determine the, the inclusion exclusion criteria to build the cohort. And it can compute the result. I can show you a very brief uh, video on how this works and what's the, the user experience. So this video is real time. Uh, with a set of three servers running in the, in the background. Uh, so this is the, the main user interface. Uh, this is a, a widespread uh, cohort exploration tool. So we have not produced this interface. We have just integrated uh, uh, behind the curtains all the, the computing, uh, all the encrypted machinery to, to make it work. Uh, so the user will uh, take the, the, the concepts, bring them to, the, to these panels, and with this, uh, it builds a logical, uh, a Boolean, a function on the terms that determines which are the inclusion exclusion criteria. This is sent back for computing to the three uh, servers that are running in different institutions, and the result can be obtained given that there are 633 subjects that have melanoma in this uh, cohort, so in this data set, uh, spread across the three institutions. If we want to go farther and we want to obtain a more complex query, uh, we can also uh, put the more traits, more information, that, for example, determining which is the which are the genetic, genomic mutations that the patient presents or the individual presents uh, to um, make the link between these mutations and the pathology that in this case is, is melanoma. Uh, this is encrypted in the background, sent to the computation. The query is executed by the three different servers by running all the distributed protocols that I showed before, the homomorphic ag aggregation. And once that uh, this process ends, it comes back as a result that the user can directly show and display. And as you can see, there are no keys, there's no crypto, there's no, uh, let's say, a, a disruption of the usual uh, workflow and the usual uh, user interface. Uh, so all the key management happens also behind the curtains. It's managed by the, in the browser directly. Uh, so we strive to make everything as transparent as possible so it can be usable and it's easy to, to adopt it. And uh, you have seen that this operation is, is real time, uh, but uh, to give you just the view of what's the overhead of, uh, of this computation, uh, for a typical use case of a uh, um, uh, reasonably dimensioned database with uh, several tens of billions of observations, so this is a reasonably sized uh, genomic database, uh, the Red curve here shows the response time for the clear text system. So this is the response time from the database to get the result of the, the, the number of patients that match. 
and the blue line is the response of the metro system. So with all the encrypted machinery in place and all the uh, uh, additional protection and additional uh, security guarantees and privacy guarantees. So you can see that the overhead is basically two seconds over uh, several minutes of computation. So it's it's uh, completely non-perceptible for the for the end user. It happens the same. We scale the, the size of the database. We scale the number of query variables. We scale the number of uh, matching patients per node. So the results are consistent in uh, a very small overhead. And this can only be achieved through a smart combination of homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, uh, and uh, differential privacy for the for the real, for the result release. Uh, if we go to a bit more complex uh, uh, set of operations like uh, uh, machine learning, uh, we have uh, also produced, and, and uh, this is also state-of-the-art uh, uh, techniques, dealing with uh, some basic statistics and also with some machine learning operations. And in particular, this can also be applied to the distributed setting where we have uh, several different um, health or financial institutions with uh, uh, databases uh, hosting uh, a vertically or horizontally partitioned database. And uh, a researcher that wants to perform uh, or train uh, logistic or linear regression on this data uh, to get the intuition on which are the, the existing correlation or the existing dependencies uh, between the data. We again assume that uh, all these actors are not trusted, so they are semi-honest, so they will follow the protocol, but they might trust, they might try to uh, infer further information from the, the values that they get uh, from the transcript of the protocol. So again, the, the workflow is exactly the same as for the, as for the discovery one that I have just mentioned, the feasibility analysis. Uh, in this case, the, the user encrypts the, instead of encrypting the, the query terms here, uh, she will define uh, given a functionality, for example, training a linear logistic regression, and send this functionality back to the servers. And then the servers, it's easier if I show it here, uh, so this, each of the of these data providers will create an encrypted summary of their data, depending on the operation that was uh, requested. And again, no individual data is sent out of uh, any of these institutions, but the encrypted summaries can be circulated across the, the network in order to synchronize all of them together. And following a federated learning approach, uh, we can compute a global result that is consistent across the whole network and have the final trained uh, regression or trained uh, network uh, trained model uh, that fits the whole database without bringing any individual data to any other uh, institution that is not the one in which it was uh, in which it originated initially so these are some uh, efficiency numbers and accuracy numbers that we can get with these techniques for uh, several in this case they are uh, health databases with a varying number of uh, records, uh, this is the, the number of observations, the number of records going from uh, 2000 to uh, 80,000, uh, to 8,000, sorry, uh, the number of features, the number of variables going from 8 to 44, and the number of iterations for uh, getting to the final result. Uh, the blue bars uh, plus the, the green bars, gray bars, uh, are the, uh, the total response time for getting the, the result of the computation. Uh, and you can see that it's possible to get uh, uh, very efficiently in less than uh, 20 seconds, but in most cases in less than five seconds, uh, to get the result of training this, uh, this regression on these databases. The yellow bar represents uh, what we put here as the represent here as the proof overhead. And this is the case if we consider also that the computing servers can be malicious, so they can deviate from the computation and either try to distort the results or do some lazy computations or avoid uh, doing the computations that they have to do to have correct results. It is possible uh, also to produce proofs, and these are called, called zero-knowledge proofs, uh, to check that the computation was correct, and to check that uh, all the actors in the, systems, in the system behaved as expected. And the cost of producing and checking this, uh, these proofs is this yellow bar that is shown on top of the, uh, of the blue one. Uh, of course, this is normally not needed for, or, or not the the, uh, the usual trust assumption uh, in uh, health networks or financial networks, because uh, if it is discovered that uh, some of uh, the institutions misbehaves, then this will 
uh, suppose a, a real reputation harm on, on this uh, institution and the fact that it will not be allowed to participate in any similar network in the future. So this is normally not the case. Uh, in terms of um, a performance, uh, so the, the accuracy of the results for the regression, so how the use of encryption and the use of all these protocols affects the, the result of the computation, uh, we have still here some uh, representative numbers where we are comparing the centralized uh, solution. So we'll, when we bring all the data together to a central repository, we perform the training there, we obtain the results of the whole data set, of the whole data set in one central place, and the uh, one running through these uh, secure distributed protocols and homework encryption. And for some of the databases, uh, it might be really surprising that we achieve a, a higher uh, accuracy. But this uh, comes, so this can be, uh, uh, this can happen uh, when the uh, uh, the model that is being trained is uh, slightly overfit, overfitting to the to the data. Uh, in that case, for enabling this kind of uh, encrypted solutions, we have to quantize the data, convert the data to integers so that they can be uh, encrypted afterwards, because all the encryptions have to work with integer data. And this quantization and the noise addition that we have in some of the, the steps of the process means that uh, we are partially removing uh, the part of the noise that comes from the, the inputs. So if the inputs were noisy, uh, we are kind of covering also that noise with the, the noise uh, that is uh, uh, introduced uh, in the uh, input coding and in the, the processing, in the encrypted processing. And this kind of decouples a bit the, the results from some peculiarities of the data. And if the model uh, was uh, overfitting, then we kind of uh, improve on a bit on the generalizability of the model thanks to, to, to this uh, additional distortion. Uh, but in, the, in a general case, uh, we normally lose a bit of, uh, of performance, a bit of accuracy. And in this case here, for these two data sets, uh, we are losing a, a two or three percent. And this uh, this is due to the fact that we are doing uh, an approximation. So we are uh, computing an approximation of the objective function instead of the exact objective function. Uh, here, the approximation is very rough. It's a, it's a linear approximation. We can work with higher order approximations that can uh, bring and bridge this gap and, and bring back the, the accuracy uh, to a similar level as the original accuracy. So again, this is another trade-off of these systems. Uh, in this case, between the, the uh, efficiency and accuracy of the results. Uh, so just to uh, conclude this part, is we we can enabling we can enable through the combination of homework encryption, multi-party encryption, differential privacy, a set of uh, efficient operations on distributed data sets, uh, dealing with basic statistics, but also training of machine learning models. Uh, we're also working, and this is one of the uh, hot topics in, in uh, secure computing research, uh, with more complex uh, machine learning models like uh, neural networks, deep learning, and so on. This is currently being addressed by the, by the community, and uh, we're also working on that. Uh, we can achieve uh, further guarantees in terms of data confidentiality, enabling especially these kind of uh, distributed applications where data comes from different institutions. And uh, in terms of privacy, uh, we achieve a result that only the curator, only the researcher, the research application will get the final result with also some differential privacy guarantees if needed. Uh, in terms of uh, practical deployment and um, uh, what we're doing right now to, to bring these systems to an operational setting, in the case of Switzerland, uh, we are talking with the main uh, university hospitals in Switzerland to deploy. Uh, the system that uh, I have shown before, the demo, the video demo that I have shown before, uh, so that they can use uh, this system for uh, oncology uh, research or for determining the, so for executing the first steps of the, the uh, clinical research and translational research on medical databases. Uh, and the plan is to have it deployed and running during the next uh, years, so the next uh, 12 months. Uh, at least in three uh, different university hospitals and later also involve uh, the rest of the university hospitals and the, the cantonal non-university hospitals also to uh, benefit from the, uh, from the enhanced uh, privacy guarantees of the system. So this is a, um, a, a practical application that we are currently ac actually deploying in a, in a real operational setting. 
Uh, so just to wrap up the challenges and, and opportunities, so the data sharing plays a major role both in health and the financial sectors. So the, the risk at which uh, financial health data uh, are, especially in the, last, in the last years, where we have witnessed so many uh, attacks, so many data misuse, uh, also ransomware attacks in, in, in hospitals, financial institutions, and, and many other uh, institutions dealing with uh, sensitive personal data. And the fact that the data collection is increasingly growing, not only from the, in the health scenario where, for example, the availability of data sequencing is uh, I mean, blowing up the scale to which uh, genomic data and omics data is available, but also uh, from life tracking devices and, and uh, wearable devices, connected devices that uh, individuals and citizens uh, are uh, constantly taking on, their, on themselves and constantly reporting information to the server. So this constant stream of information collected uh, is personal information and sensitive information that is still at risk, the same as the information hosted by uh, let's say, traditionally considered secure institutions like hospitals or banks. And in order to make use of this information and make sense of what this information means in order to enable a better, more accurate, and more precise, more personalized applications uh, for customers and individuals, uh, techniques like homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy have to be in place in order to uh, translate the uh, user consent and user uh, policies for privacy policies for the, the use of their data into technological guarantees. This in the financial sector translates into uh, benefits for the, for the banks, for example, more accurate fraud detection, having access to bigger data sets, and being able to uh, better detect the patterns in uh, fraud operations, uh, intelligent automated personal finance management advisor uh, by bringing the data from the customers uh, either to the cloud or to the financial institution, uh, bringing also data from uh, let's say uh, 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 other financial operations that the, the customer might uh, execute that are not by default seen by the bank, uh, but that are also related to the, the the patterns and the behavior of the, of the customer that can determine uh, which are the right products uh, that, the, that this customer uh, might uh, or that might be appealing for the for the customer. So in this case, uh, bringing all this information in a way that it can be computed on and it can be uh, so some uh, uh, results, some conclusions can be drawn about this information without exposing it to the bank itself uh, is really valuable. And uh, also analyzing financial risk exposures, uh, uh, determining market trends. Uh, so data sharing is crucial in all these operations, and all these uh, operations uh, are essential for the evolution of the, the financial sector. And these can be enabled through uh, these kind of privacy-enhancing techniques. So that's that concludes uh, the, the talk. Uh, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer, and thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thanks. Uh, so this was an extremely fascinating presentation and probably the most technical presentation I've ever been to in my life. So that's, so caveating with that, um, not a topic I know anything about. Uh, so I've been trying very hard to follow along uh, and understand it as best I can. So full disclaimers on the table um, to begin. So I'm really trying hard to th think about the use cases for uh, the financial sector um, and ICT sector and how something like this gets implemented practically within that sector and what the incentives would be to do that and what the pra what the practical costs, um, like investment that would need to be made or hardware that would be needed, uh, computation kind of facilities that would be needed. And just thinking of like who, who manages the network, who owns it, like how do you do this? I'm just like, who, who would be, who would take this up? And to do this in the financial sector, you know, and like what kind of resources are necessary? Well, the, the, this is again one of the main uh, barriers of this kind of technology that the, the, you need a security expert, you need a privacy expert 
uh, to be able to deal with uh, the parameterization and the optimization of these systems uh, for the use case or for the application. And that's uh, the, the byproduct of the fact that there's no generic solution that can apply to any use case, like, for, for example, uh, fully homomorphic encryption would be. If fully, fully, fully homomorphic encryption uh, were practical nowadays, then we will not, will not be talking about this because it, it would be solved already. Uh, the problem is that we need this combination, these hybrid systems and this fine tuning of the security. And for that, a privacy expert, security expert is needed in the system design. Uh, it's also true that uh, security and, and privacy, by extension, shouldn't be an afterthought. So in the design process, uh, security privacy shouldn't be just something that is plugged in at the end of the process. It should be uh, taken into account by design. So privacy by design, security by design, is one of the main factors that can uh, lead uh, these kind of solutions to success. Uh, I think that the, the main issue now, uh, right now for, for the adoption of this technology is awareness. More than any other uh, cost factors or, or cost-effective solution, uh, it's awareness. So first, most individuals don't know that these kind of techn technologies exist, and it's possible to get the same services or get similar services without giving away privacy, without giving away the right to protect their data. So awareness is a, is a huge factor, not only on the citizens, but also on the, um, say, industry uh, sector, where uh, some cloud operations can be uh, implemented. And with these kinds of technologies, the risk of a breach, the risk of, um, of being fined uh, due to the increasingly strict uh, regulations for data protection, can be lowered and can be minimized by relying on these technologies. And I think this is the main motivation and the main factor that can lead to the, the adoption. So the fact that we don't have, uh, we have not only a system that is compliant with the regulations, but a system that goes beyond and further minimizes the risk. And the, the regulation I mean, is tightly related to the, to, to the application of these technologies. So without regulation, these technologies will not be needed because there will be no, no right to protect, no specific uh, requirements that uh, we would have to fulfill with these kind of, uh, of, of uh, applications. And the, the things that normally uh, the, the law doesn't collect or doesn't uh, explicitly mention which technologies have to be applied. This is good and bad. So technology and, and regulation advance at different paces, of course. Uh, normally, uh, regulators and, and uh, technology experts, uh, we speak in really different languages, so it's, it's kind of difficult to, to bring both communities together and understand each other uh, in a way that can be productive and can bring both to, to uh, take advantage of the synergies between both, both communities. And this is something that we're trying to, to, to do here, and this is one key factor for us, uh, technology specialists, to understand the, the regulatory and ethical constraints and for the uh, uh, regulators and the, the ethical experts and lawyers to understand what technology can do in order to translate the, the, the regulations and the guidelines into uh, guarantees that can be formally proven. Uh, this for, for privacy enhancing techniques uh, has not arrived yet. So for the moment, what, uh, what uh, GDPR in, in Europe, for example, uh, says, uh, it's all, it always goes to, uh, okay, these are the, the uh, the, the entities need to minimize the risk of re-identification. Uh, they need to apply state-of-the-art technologies, uh, apply the, the, uh, the most uh, recent uh, protection mechanisms, but there's no uh, mention to homomorphic encryption or what happens with encrypted data. Uh, and this means that as soon as these technologies are state-of-the-art, they are already implementing the, the, the regulation. So this is the best level of protection. This is the, the uh, better than you can get to minimize the risk with respect to traditional protection mechanism or organizational measures. So this means that, in a sense, we are already translating this law or interpreting this law in terms of getting the best technology you can get or best technology you can uh, uh, guarantee to fulfill the, the data protection regulation. I think this would be the main motivation for adoption in the industrial sector and both for, for financial sector. The health sector is, is kind of a bit more uh, particular in the sense, it's a bit different because 
uh, the the um, the harm that a breach can do in uh, in hospital is, is huge, it's tremendous. So just the risk of uh, the data being expo exposed, not only the, the risk of uh, of getting fined or, or being deemed uh, liable or responsible for for that uh, leakage, is just the 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 trust problem. So the 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 harm that it would represent in terms of uh, consumer trust would be tremendous. And just to avoid that, the, the, the hospitals are, are, are doing whatever they can to, to, protect the state, to protect the data and to get the data uh, uh, safe. But at the same time, a clinical research has to advance. And the understanding of the clinical data and genomic data uh, is not complete yet. So unless we have means to process the data while complying with the regulation and avoiding or, or mitigating the risks of breaches, the research will not advance. And then we will have a block in uh, healthcare, a block in global well being. And this is another factor that can bring this adoption. And that's the reason why the health sector is kind of more open to uh, getting these kind of techniques and then applying them in, uh, in operational settings. On the other hand, I'm talking about uh, not only uh, hard laws, but if you go to soft laws, uh, there are recommendations in terms of uh, anonymization, uh, identification, pseudonymization, and so on. Again, cryptography is, is a bit more difficult to, to find in, the, in soft laws, but this document from the World Economic Forum on the adoption on the, the role of privacy enhancing techniques in the financial sector is quite telling of the trends of the market and the relevance that these technologies are achieving in this market. So I would say that in the upcoming short term, mid term, five, 10 years, uh, it would be common to talk about uh, solutions based on these techniques in the financial sector. And the, the adoption is, I think, the same. The cost for adoption brings knowledge cost. So having specialists that can understand and uh, design and uh, parameterize uh, these systems. And in terms of uh, hardware and, uh, and uh, logistics, if you go to software solutions, the, the costs are, are basically the same. So it's just increasing the, the having a, a bigger overhead that comes also with the same life cycle for, for renewal of technology that uh, happens naturally already. If you go to hardware-based solutions, then the, that's different because then you need to invest on the specific hardware. But run, right now, hardware solutions are in all consumer products. So in all, in all available consumer uh, computers and, and uh, processing hardware, they are already present. So I think the, the barrier in terms of, uh, of uh, cost is not too high, and it's becoming uh, more and more negligible, I would say. So you know, if I've answered 